Hey, good morning, and welcome to Life Church. I'm glad you're here this morning. I'm glad if you're watching online. We're in a series entitled, It Came From Within. It Came From Within. And we were, talked about how we have these filters. And these filters, as we get older, get a little more sophisticated, a little more complex, right? And these filters enable us to act a certain way. You know, they, they prevent us from saying the wrong thing at the wrong time or doing the wrong thing at the wrong place. And, and so we have all these different filters depending on where we're at and, and how we want people to perceive us. But every once in a while, right, every once in a while, something will come out. Something will come out. You will say something. You will do something. And people are surprised. And even yourself will say, wow, I don't know where this came from. But if you were here last week, we learned that Jesus says, I know where that came from. It came from your heart. You're thinking, no, 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 that, that didn't come from my heart. That was, that was just a slip up. No, it came from your heart. It was there. It's these filters that you have, right? All these filters that you've developed over time to keep it inside. But the truth is, that's what's really in your heart. The only reason it doesn't come out all the time, the reason you don't do all these things, because you've learned how to keep those filters in place. But the problem is that every once in a while, things are going to slip through. Things are going to break through that filter. And then really the things that are in your heart will come out. As a matter of fact, Jesus said that essentially all of life emanates from your heart. And, and he says, these are some of the things that come out of your heart. He said, evil thoughts and murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. Even Solomon, the, the wisest man that ever lived, in Proverbs 4 said this, he says, above all else, okay, again, this is the guy who wrote about so many things and so many topics, but he says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is a wellspring of life. And so for the next four weeks, we're going to look at specific each, uh, issues, specific creatures that will get in there that lurk within you, within your heart, they get lodged in. Perhaps for some of you got lodged in when you were children. And we're going to look and deal with some of these creatures. So my hope is to be able to expose them to some of the, the light and prevent you from, from living a life of heartache and pain. Scriptures tells us that those things that stay in the darkness, they, they grow and they grow and they grow and that over time, they have the power to come through that filter that we have created over time. And ultimately, it gets us into trouble, causes us to act in a way that we're not used to and people don't understand what these things are. But we develop these habits each of these four things are kind of best described in the, and best understood when dealt with in terms of a debt-debtor relationship. Each one of these things really causes an imbalance, an imbalance in our relationships. And the best way to think about this is basically uh, having a debt. Think of it through a debt, if you owed someone money. For example, let's say you owed someone money or, or someone owed you some money, right? And then when you have that encounter with them, when you're together with them, you know, you, you kind of don't talk about it, but it's kind of still there, right? It kind of lingers around you. You kind of feel it. You may not say anything about it. They might not mention it. But there's something there, there. There's an imbalance in that relationship because you owe me or I know that I owe you. And so there is this imbalance. And oftentimes it just feels 
uncomfortable. So when these four things are lodged in our heart, even if we don't know that they're lodged, and when we refuse to do anything about it, it causes an imbalance in our relationships. And so today we're going to tackle the, the hardest one of all. We're going to start with the toughest, right? Start with the toughest, and then we're going to work our way down. At least for me, the toughest one. And this first one we're going to talk, this first creature that we're going to wrestle with and deal with is guilt. Guilt. Guilt is something that we have, that we all experience. Guilt, uh, by the way, as it relates to church, a lot of people associate church with guilt. And the church that if you're, you know, for many people, if your guilt kind of went away, you may never come back to church. Sometimes the only thing that pulls you into church is the guilt, right? You've done things wrong, you want to get right, go to church. You, you kind of feel like, like this is the place. And, and I've been in services where, where preachers will just try to guilt you into doing stuff, guilt you into coming forward, or, or guilt you into giving towards something. And so we, we have this idea and connection with church and guilt. The truth is, though, that nowhere in the New Testament uh, does it say that we're to leverage guilt. And I believe the reason why is because generally guilty people are the ones who leverage guilt on others to try to get them to do stuff, right? It's generally guilty people who deal in the currency of guilt. And see, Jesus, Jesus never did that. And the reason is because Jesus was never guilty. And because he had no guilt, therefore he didn't deal in guilt. He didn't leverage guilt. And so if your whole take on religion is about guilt, you know, church is trying to get me to do something, to give something I don't want to give. Uh, if you're in an environment, whether it is church, whether it's at home or at work, if you're in an environment of guilt, uh, you need to exit. You need to get out of that because it is extraordinarily unhealthy. And undealt with, guilt becomes a heart issue. And guilt begins to impact not only you, but all of your relationship. It, it impacts all the people around you. Remember, God doesn't deal with us through guilt. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that it is your kindness, O oh God, that leads us to repentance. What leads us to repent is not God guilting us, but leading us through his grace and his mercy and his love. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. So guilt, guilt is like a creature. Guilt is it's like this little monster. Guilt is a problem that needs to be remedied. Uh, not It should not be a part, a permanent part of your life. See, the thing about guilt is guilt says, I owe you. You know, I've offended you. I've stolen from you. I've lied to you or about you. I've done something. I've done something to you. Right? I, I wrecked your home. I, I wrecked our home. I, I showed up when I wasn't supposed to. I didn't show up when I should have. I cheated on something. So guilt says, I've done something to offend you. Therefore, I owe you. And that builds an inequity in the relationship. In other words, when you offend someone, you say, what do you say? I owe you what? An apology. Right? I owe you an apology. I owe you something. I wronged you. I, I hurt you. I offended you. I, I lied to you. I, I ripped you off. I did something, whatever it was. And so I owe you something. And that's because there is this debt, debtor relationship between the offender and the offended. That's why sometimes we'll say things like, let me what, make it up to you, right? Let me make it up to you. Let me do something to, to balance this off. Because when you offend or you hurt somebody, you sin against somebody, 
It builds this inequity. There's something that says inside of you, I need to pay this back. Every time you offend someone or, or hurt someone intentionally or, or even unintentionally, there's a sense in which you have taken something from them. If you lie to somebody, well, you, you've robbed them of the truth, right? If you run off on your family, you've robbed your, your wife of security. You've robbed your children of a, a dad or a mom. Whoever you, whenever rather, you hurt somebody, whenever you offend somebody, whenever you, you wrong somebody, you, you've taken something from them. And you've caused this inequity. It creates this debt-debtor relationship. Guilt is just that, that inner sense in your heart where you know you did something wrong. That was causes, that's what causes guilt. That's really basically what, what guilt is. And the thing is that we the way we experience guilt is it's it's like a weight. Right? It's not, it's like a like a burden. And we carry this weight around with us. And oftentimes we'll we'll pick up this weight early on as a kid. Sometimes we pick it up in, in college or when we're dating or early in our marriage or early in our career. Somewhere along the line, we, we pick up this guilt. And we tend to carry it and carry it. And the problem with it is that when we carry this burden, when we carry this guilt, we'll carry it into other relationships. It's not just I carry it in college. No, I, I carry it in college, but now I'm engaged and I'm going to get married. And I'm still carrying this weight. And, and now I'm well into my career, but I still have this, this weight that's on top of me. It's all unresolved guilt. It's impossible sometimes for us to see that we're carrying this way because it becomes such a part of us that we, we don't even recognize it. And again, it could be we can carry this for weeks or months or even years from season to season to season. And when somebody tries to confront you about it, right, we'll, we'll say, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea. Step further, underneath guilt. If you really to unpack it all, you know what you find? You can find anger. Who are you angry at? Who are angry people, or rather, who are guilty people angry at? Usually it's themselves. I let me down. I, I swore I would never, but I did. I swore I would, all, but I didn't. I will and I won't. I went into that job with these kinds of values and ethics, and the first time that they asked me to do something crooked, I went ahead and I did it. I failed. I sacrificed my ethics. I promised my kids, but I didn't. And if you were to peel back, what you find is ultimately that you're mad at, at you. At you. I, I didn't meet your expectation. You weren't the man you thought you would be. You weren't the woman you thought you would be. You weren't the father or the husband or the mother that you wanted to be. You're not the parent that you should have been, and you're angry at yourself. And anytime you carry anger, it's not isolated to the event in which you picked it up. You carry it with you into all of your relationships. You carry it into almost every season of your life until you figure out some way to put it down. It's almost impossible for a man or a woman who's carrying a load of guilt to see it, to understand it. I didn't live up to my expectations. And, and here's the thing. Since I disappointed me, I'm going to find a way for you to disappoint me too. So, since I'm not the man I thought I should be, I'm going to make sure to find a way to assure myself that you're not the man that you thought you were either. If you're carrying a load of guilt, there's almost no way for you to see this. But I promise you that the people around you, the people that live with you and work with you, uh, they see it. 
They see it clearly. And they can't understand why uh, they can't ever get things right. Where, where nothing's ever good enough. But you know, the Lord Jesus, he could have leveraged guilt, right? But he didn't do it. See, the thing is that The reason he, Jesus didn't do it was because he was not a man who carried around guilt. He had no guilt. See, your disappointment with you, my disappointment with me, creates an anger, it creates a, a burden, it creates this weight, and it impacts all the relationships we have with the people around us. There's a sense in which I don't think I have any choice. I have to carry this. And the truth is that guilt, guilt is a heart issue. It, it eats at your heart. It grows in the darkness. And it only dissipates or gets destroyed by light. Bringing those secrets into the light, that's what scares most people to death, though, right? Because really with, with guilt, you have two options. You can repay the debt, which is almost impossible, oftentimes. I mean, you can go and you can ask this person to look to took, that you took from to cancel the debt, right? You can either make it up and uh, repay the debt, again, which is oftentimes possible. Or you can ask the person to cancel the debt. But to this, both of these require what? They require her confession. They require confession. See, confession is what breaks the power of guilt. It, it destroys the death grip that guilt has on you. It, it shines a big light on it into those dark places in your heart where all those creepy, crawly things are, are all around there. And it begins to give you the power to clean all that out. See, if you're carrying a load of guilt and you want to desperately Forgive yourself. You'll never adequately forgive yourself as long as it's a secret. You'll never be able to, to come to the place where you, you're totally free of it until you begin to confess it openly. See, the Bible has much more to say about confession than it does about, I mean, rather, the Bible has a lot more about confessing to other people than it does about confessing to God. Because the attitude is most of us will say, you know what, I'll, I'll confess. I'll confess it to the Lord. I'll confess it to God. Or we might say, you know what, I'll confess it to, to someone spiritual. Well, I'll go to the priest. I'll go to confession and confess it there. The only problem is that when you do that, when you just confess it to the Lord, a week later, a month later, you're, you're carrying that burden again. See, Scripture teaches us that it's not about telling God these things that you've done. He already knows. Right? You're not surprising the Lord with coming to Him with it. It's about going to the person you offended and shining a big old spotlight of truth on your guilt. In the Old Testament, the first time where God deals with this specifically uh, is in Numbers. The book of Numbers in chapter 5. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, Any man or woman who wrongs another in any way and is so unfaithful to the Lord is guilty and must confess the sin they have committed. They must make full restitution for the wrong they have done, add a fifth of the value to it, and give it all to the person they have wronged. And so God says to Moses, he says, don't just tell me about it and think all is well. You need to go to that person and confess it to them, and then you got to make it right. As a matter of fact, you have to add 20% to it. You remember the story of Zacchaeus in the Bible? Zacchaeus was a, a tax collector for the Roman Empire. Hate it. 
and he cheated a ton of people doing it, which is why he was hated, right? And Jesus comes along, and boy, he really wanted to, to see Jesus. He climbs up this tree, and Jesus sees him and says, hey, tonight I'm going to eat at your house. And so they eat at his house. And while they were eating, Zacchaeus has a change of heart. And he says to Jesus, he says, look, I have ripped off all, ripped off all these people. So here's what I'm going to do. I am going to give back everything that I've stolen. But not only that, I'm going to add a 20% on top of that for each person. And Jesus didn't sit there and go, oh, Zacchaeus, you don't need to do that. See, you've already confessed it to me, and, and you know what? You're forgiven. That's all. It's you, you changed your heart, and that's all that matters. No. Jesus said, if you're going, Jesus said, salvation has come to this man's house today. In other words, he, he was encouraging him. He said, that's a good thing. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, if you... Go to the temple with your sacrifice to give unto the Lord. And you've got an issue with a brother or sister. You have a problem with somebody. He said, leave your offering there and go make it right first. Go make it right first. Then after you've made it right, then you can come back and give your offering to the Lord. And James, the, the half-brother of Jesus, in James 5, 16, he says this, he says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other. Confess your sins to each other. This New Testament command, James, says, Confess your sins not to God. Not to God, but to each other. And if you look at the rest of the verse, it says, So that you may be healed. So that you can get your heart right and you can be healed. See, the, uh, Jesus is saying, see, there's, there's, Jesus, there's, they're saying, there's something wrong inside. A big misconception is that the goal of confession is simply a clear conscience, but it's not. The goal of confession is a changed life, a changed life. In the New Testament, God's way. It's more concerned about your heart than the momentary flash of conscious relief. It's not just about, oh, I feel so much better now. Jesus says, look, I, I'm just trying to clean your conscience. I, I want you to change. I want your heart to be pure because, again, you live from your heart. And if you've got unresolved guilt, that you're dragging around with season to season in your life and from relationship to relationship, I just want you to dump it. And you dump it by confessing it, not just to me, but to the person that you offended. So, bottom line, here's the deal. Most of you are thinking, it's easy to say, but you know, if I go to my husband, if I go to my wife, I go to my boss, right? Man, bad things are going to happen. If I confess this stuff, it's just going to be crazy. I, I'm just going to hurt them. To which I say, yeah, you already hurt them. See, confession doesn't hurt people. The sin is what hurts the people. It's the concealment that hurts the people. Besides, that person probably already knows something is wrong. And the reason we don't confess is because we're, we're scared of the consequences. The truth is, though, as long as you drag this stuff around, your heart is rotting away. And that filter is starting to break down, and it's going to break down. You can't just try to filter this the rest of your life. I know that the, the consequences are tangible and, and usually pretty immediately. And it's going to impact a, a small group of people. But the consequences of concealment are, are tangible and, and they uh, impact 
most of your relationships and most of your life and you drag it around for a lifetime and God would say to you, I know it's painful. I know you're scared, but don't allow the consequences to chase you your whole life long. Don't drag that with you forever. God would say to you, you know what? Just confess it and deal with it and put it behind you and just face the consequences and then go on with your life. So here's what I suggest, baby steps. At the end of the day, if you do it, well, baby steps. First, confess it to someone you know, that you can trust, but that you see on a regular basis. Right? Maybe to get up the nerves. And secondly, you have to ultimately confess it to the person you sinned against. Try to make some kind of restitution. Again, in most cases, perhaps you, you can't make restitution. How do you make a restitution to someone who you've heard for a long period of time? What will happen on the outside world will become momentarily complicated. But your inside world will become free. And at the end of the day, you'll be able to forgive yourself. And forgive yourself properly and completely. And my question is this, how are things in your life? Do you have any secrets? Are you, are you carrying around a load? Would you be willing to complicate your life for a short time in order to free yourself for a long term? Are you willing to face the tangible consequences instead of living a life with a lot of guilt? Would you be willing to trust our Heavenly Father in your way?